Good morning. morning. It's been a tasty morning. Um, As we prepare to sing worship to the Lord, we're going to start with a reading from Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Would you stand with us as we sing? Bring love. 
Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone's full. Those were very delicious. Morgan and Derek, thank you very much for bringing, bringing breakfast burritos. If you haven't got one, there's still some out there. You should get some. Oh, fam, you're missing out. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe you, can, you might need to message it, Derek and Morgan be like, hey, can you do a like swing by my house kind of thing? Because they're real good. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, so last week we, we talked about our pantry out in our parking lot. And so over Lent, over the next few weeks, we are going to be focused on um, bringing in things to fill that pantry because it's getting used a lot. Um, so if you um, didn't get the email, there's like some specifics. Or if you don't know what might be a good thing to bring, um, you can talk to Teresa. She has a great list of things that um, when people need something quickly, um, we, we want to have it out there. So if, you need, if they need something like the truck stop, like I think the truckers are using it, but even people in town are using it. Um, so today was breakfast items. Um, Teresa, what's next week? Oh, there's a list out there. Perfect. There is also a, um, a she just brought in a little um, tote thing that you can drop your stuff in out there too. So if you want to drop by out, um, out in the foyer area in the gathering place, and you want to know what to bring for next week, just check out the list. Um, and we are trying to fill that and be intentional about keeping that full. Then also starting March 14th is going to be the women's um, crazy love. We're going to be meeting. Um, but keep an eye out for small group because we're wanting to offset it. And then Holy Week is kind of in the middle of that. So um, we are. there's going to be... We won't be meeting. No one will be meeting that week. And so um, Josiah and Isabel may be um, switching around when they're meeting. So just keep an eye on the communication. If you are part of small group at Josiah and Isabel's house, um, just be looking for communication going out this week of the next time when they are going to be meeting. Um, I think that is the major points to hit on this morning. So let's pray and continue to worship together. Jesus, as we enter your presence this morning, we just, <clears throat> we quiet our hearts. We focus on your greatness. As we sang this morning, great are you, Lord. And it's not just the things you do for us, but it's who you are. God, and we just want to praise you and worship you for who you are this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. you bore, so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore.
come to the prayers of the people, we're going to begin with a moment of silent contemplation and confession. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. We pray for all of those in our community and all the people that they love who need healing in their bodies. Show up in their stories and heal. Protect us as our bodies do what you created them to do. We pray for peace of mind as they face diagnoses, treatments, and uncertainty. Lord, give them the courage to turn to you when fear tries to overwhelm. We pray as always for the youth of Open Table and of our community that they would experience true revival. We pray that you would draw them close to you in such a real way that they would also lead us into revival. God, we pray for the government, globally, nationally, state, and locally. We believe that you have placed those people in positions, and we take seriously our duty to pray for them. Give them wisdom to lead, the courage to do what is right, and the humility to seek you. We pray for all of those resident in prison and their families. May they be aware of your presence with them, and may your spirit bring them peace and the hope of new life in Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to show your compassion and your love as the father to the fatherless. For those who are in need of a home and those in need of parents. We pray for widows, 
We pray for men and women who have lost their spouses and who have experienced the hurt and pain and now experience the loneliness that goes along with that. God, be with them in their distress and help us to be a picture of your grace and your mercy and your love. We pray for all of those that are grieving this morning, for we know that you are close to the brokenhearted. May those who are experiencing loss feel your presence and rest in the peace that passes all understanding. <clears throat> we pray for our small groups, our OG men's ministry and story girls. We ask that you will use them to connect us more as a family and to empower us to bless this world. This next, um, sorry. Uh, we're praying for missionaries next, and I have a very good missionary friend who lost her life this last weekend um, when she was in Tanzania. She was with YWAM, and 11 of them lost their lives in a bus accident. God, we pray for missionaries. We pray that you would give them protection, resources, and guidance. May the Holy Spirit move on those whom they share the gospel with. We pray specifically for the families of the 11 who lost their lives last weekend. And we pray that you would bring many to the family because of this. That your glory would shine in the midst of pain. We continue to pray for our OFAM scattered all over in various places that even though we don't get to see them and hug them, you might help them feel like they are a part of us and with us bind our hearts together as a church and help us to live in fidelity to each other and to you. And for all of the prayers to which we are not yet ready to give voice, would you search our hearts and make intercession on our behalf as our church family stands with us in agreement for our good. And above all else, would you let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven.
We've come to the time in our service where we're going to release the kids to go down to their classes, but before we do, uh, we would like to bless them. So if you would place your hands on your child or stretch out your hands to the children that are around you, we're going to pray. <clears throat> Dear Father, your son gladly welcomed little children. He took them in his arms, blessed them, and held them up as an example proclaiming that all of us should receive the kingdom of God as a child does. So help us as parents to also bless our children as we release them to you so that you are free to fully accomplish 
all that you desire in them and through them. Please fill our families with your truth and cover us with your favor. Teach our children to see themselves in the story of God, and above all else, may they never know a day when they don't feel a part of the people of God. As for us, may we receive the teaching of your word as your servant fearlessly makes known the mystery of the gospel. In your name we offer this prayer. Amen. And as the children go to their classes, I'd go check out to see if there's more burritos. stand together and sing one more song.
from the very beginning was a command to not take your name in vain. And so often we have a tendency to think of that as words we're not supposed to say. But God, I think we can also take your name in vain by not recognizing the power in that name and not living as though we bear that name. So God, I pray this morning that you challenge us and grow us and stretch us so that we can leave here bearing the power of that name, the wonder of that name, the beauty of that name. And then we would show that to the world in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Let's dive in. Um, uh, thanks to Derek and Morgan for the for the breakfast. Um, that was pretty great. Uh, and uh, and <laughs> and um, just so you guys know, uh, we'd love to do that more. Um, just every time we spend time together and chat with people, um, it's we're doing church. Um, everybody always gives me trouble because we we start late, and I always tell them church starts dead on at ten. Music starts at like ten ten or so, but church starts when you get here and you're with other church people. So um, it doesn't matter when we start singing. Church starts when we get together. Amen? Amen. All right. So I have, uh, I have one son that has a, a really sensitive conscience. You'd think out of 16 I'd get more, but just the one. Um, <laughs> in fact, when he was probably four or five, um, several of my sons and I went to visit this friend of mine who was building a new house. And uh, it was uh, the dairy farm that I grew up working, and so it gave me a chance to kind of show the boys where I grew up and, uh, and, uh, and also kind of look at the progress of this house. Kind of a multifaceted trip. Incidentally, Esther did not go with me, um, and so all of my sons, including the three-year-old, got to ride this 250, 300-pound bull calf um, <laughs> around, which got me in a lot of trouble when I got home and my my boys with the big mouth told my, my wife all about it. Um, it, was, uh, it was pretty great. Joshua, the youngest, we only had one cowboy hat, so whoever was riding got to wear the cowboy hat. And, uh, and the bigger one, like he was tall enough that his feet could kind of drag the ground a little, so he didn't get the full ride. But Joshua got a good ride. We had a, we had a rope on him, and I had the lead rope, so the cow couldn't just go nuts. He was just going in a circle, bouncing around. And... Uh, and Joshua rode him well. I mean, he's holding the thing, and finally the, the guy gets a good buck, throws Joshua right over the top onto his face, and he, he stands up, and, and you can tell he knew, like, there's no crying in rodeo. So even though he's, like, three, he gets up, and he takes off his head, and <laughs> wow, he dusts his, his leg off with it like he's seen the Cowboys do, and he, and he holds it in. It was pretty awesome. But uh, Esther did not see the, the value of that moment. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, we were two in this house looking at the progress, and, and the boys asked if they could go downstairs. And, uh, and uh, I asked my buddy what was down there, and, and he said nothing but some ladders and paint and stuff like that. So I told the boys they could go um, look around, but they were not, this was not run around crazy time. This is if you want to go see what's down there, fine. But um, I firmly told them, no running at all. Like, if, if you run even a few steps, they're going to get a spanking. Not, I was bluffing. I never spank my kids. Um, but uh, I explained that this is a workplace, not a play place. They wanted to play. They could go climb on the hay bales, but um, no goofing around in the house. And they said, okay. So, of course, they all agreed. They went downstairs. And a few minutes later, my son with the sensitive conscience, um, I'm I'm uh, leaving his name out on purpose. Um, Comes slowly walking up the stairs. He taps me on the leg. I look down. He says, I, I forgot your rule about running for a second. And so I took off running for a couple steps. And then I remembered, so I immediately stopped. But you should probably still spank me. <laughs> that was the toughest spanking I've ever given. 
I'm kidding. I didn't. I didn't come on, people. I didn't. Spank you. Everybody's like, no, you did. Ah, uh, all of his brothers um, always gave him a hard time because he was the one to always rat him out. He was the one that tattled on everything. Um, in fact, we we had we had finished off our attic into this boys' room. It looked like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves because it was the the ceiling was the roof, and so it's just it's just long the whole length of the house, and it was just seven beds, boom, 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 that the boys lived in, and uh, and there was no bathroom up there. It was a it was a little bitty house we lived in with nine kids, and uh, we had one bathroom, and so um, and you know we have boys, so you know almost all of them wet the bed, so the room always reeked of pee, right? And, uh, and Esther hit a point where she was like, this is ridiculous. It's like every single one of them every night. And I think I, Elijah, oops. <laughs> yep. I think he had, uh, <laughs> I think he had overheard his mom kind of complaining. And so he comes down one day and he's all hang dog. And he goes, I just want to let you know that sometimes when we don't want to come downstairs to pee, we all just pee in the laundry basket. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they had a laundry basket. So they figured out if they just peed in the laundry basket, mom and dad thought it was just wetting the bed. And so, yeah, they were furious when he ratted them out. Not because they got in trouble, which they did, but because now they had to come downstairs to go pee every time they wanted to pee. <laughs> uh, and honestly, it's taken me almost 30 years of ministry to fully recognize how rare a sensitive conscience really is. Um, this is our third uh, Sunday of Lent, and this year we're looking at some of the most difficult, um, sometimes confusing, confrontations in Jesus' life. And honestly, there may be none tougher than this morning's passage. Um, but we'll look at these passages as a way of, of giving the body of Christ a scan. We're calling this series Full Body Scan, um, like a full MRI to see where any sickness might hide um, that we can maybe root out as we prepare our hearts for the resurrection of Easter. We've talked about Jesus' baptism and temptation in the wilderness. As Jesus kind of forges this incredible substitutionary link um, between his life and the life of his body, the church, um, being baptized on our behalf and winning victories over temptation of the enemy also on our behalf. And even as he launches his ministry again on our behalf and says, now that you've seen me do these things, you go and do likewise um, and then eventually embracing his own death, most assuredly, on our behalf. Um, last week we talked about our vision and more precisely our perspective. Um, we unpacked this moment where Peter, with a good heart and good motives, tries to protect Jesus only to find out that he's actually playing the role of Satan in this moment. Um, and, and the one and only thing he was wrong on is that he wasn't seeing things from God's perspective. Um, Jesus told him that he was only seeing things from man's perspective. As the body of Christ, we need to have our vision healed um, so we can see things from God's perspective. Well, this morning we're launching into one of the most curious um, and honestly frightening moments in Jesus' life. Um, some people love this story because they resonate with the Jesus they find in this story. Um, but others of us have no idea what even to make of this story. And honestly, it... it changes some of the neat little boxes we'd love to uh, tuck Jesus into. We're going to be reading from John 2, if you want to follow in your own Bible. It reads like this. Uh, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle and sheep, and doves and for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip out of some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins all over the floors and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he said, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And then his disciples remembered the prophecy from the scriptures, passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What they exclaimed, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this and they believed both the scripture and what Jesus had said. This is the word of the Lord. This is the famous flipping of tables. This is Jesus's big, explosive, angry moment. Um, that every single one of us 
has used as an excuse to lose our temper without feeling guilty, right? We all do that. Please tell me it's not just me. Yeah. Uh, we flat go off on somebody who annoys us or it becomes a daily habit to go off on somebody who annoys us and, and someone quotes the fruits of the spirit at us like a jerk. Um, <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faith, and each word kind of digs a little deeper. And, uh, and right before you crumple under the conviction, you go, yeah, well, Jesus flipped tables when he was angry, right? <laughs> You've done it. Don't lie. You know. Well, Jesus does really go off this day at the temple and, and, and definitely kind of jumps off the pages of our Bibles because it seems so out of character for the, for the Jesus the gospel writers t- tell about. And I honestly believe it, it, it shocked the disciples every bit as much. Uh, it, it shocks us, it shocked them. Because John sneaks in this one line, he says, Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scripture, Passion for God's house will consume me. John's basically like, we were all standing there with our jaws on the floor, wondering what in the world just happened. And we were like, oh, that's right. This was part of the whole Messiah thing. They finally, they got it. But not at first. At first you could tell they were like, whoa. But yeah, this episode in the temple is really odd and complicated. And the deeper we dive into it, the more complex and honestly frightening and, and hopefully convicting it gets. So let's dive in and see where this is going. And I swear, uh, I'm not using this as an excuse to talk about money and tithing again uh, so soon after talking about it in our last series. Um, but to understand what's happening here, um, we have to go back to Moses' teaching on the tithe. This is Deuteronomy 14. He said, You must set aside a tithe of your crops, one-tenth of all the crops you harvest each year. Bring the tithe to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored, and eat it there in his presence. This applies to the tithe of your grains, new wines, olive oil, and firstborn males of your flock and herds. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. Now, when the Lord your God blesses you with a good harvest and the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far away to bring your tithe. If so, you may sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds, put the money in a pouch, and go to the place the Lord your God has chosen. When you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, or other alcoholic drink. Yes, that said the tithe can be spent on beer money. Um, The feet... No. (laughs) <laughs> then feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and celebrate with your household and do not neglect the Levites in your town for they will receive no allotment of land among you this is crazy practical I love Torah this basically just means that rather than drag wagon loads of grain and animals and milk and wine and oil and the 90 or so miles that it would take you to get from say Nazareth to Jerusalem you can sell your tithe, take the money to Jerusalem, and buy everything you need for the Feast of Sukkot, or tabernacles, with all your people. This was a major relief to first century Jews because this passage starts with one major caveat. Bring the tithe portion to the designated place of worship, the place your Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. No matter where they live, a Jew is supposed to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate three pilgrimage feasts, three, three pilgrimage feasts each year. By the time of Jesus, this was a big deal because they were there were Jews spread all over the Roman Empire. What historians call the, the diaspora um, started with a, the Assyrians conquering the northern ten tribes of Israel, then Babylon conquering the, the southern two tribes. Um, and in both of these conquests, a great many Jews just scattered and ran to all points of the compass. When we read our Bibles, um, we follow the ones who stayed, like Daniel and Esther and Jeremiah and Ezra and Nehemiah, but but what we don't realize is that Babylon did not capture all the Jews. A lot, maybe even most, um, just ran and and settled elsewhere. They just got out um, before getting conquered. Um, And then after Ezra and Nehemiah brought back the Jews um, who were taken captive, Um, A couple hundred years later, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid king, um, brought his armies to Israel to to oppress and and hurt the Israelites. Um, uh, And then the Maccabees revolted under Antiochus Epiphanes. And uh, and there was a pretty long reign we call the Hasmonean dynasty where Israel was free. 
um, until 63 BC, not that long before Jesus, when Rome came and conquered Israel. And in each one of these um, conquerings, each one of these battles, there was people who just didn't want to fight. Like they just left. And they were like, we'll go somewhere else. Like this, it's too hot here. Um, and they would leave. And all this history is to say when festival time came to Israel, people were traveling from much further than even Moses thought they might. He was talking about people in Israel all had to go to Jerusalem. Well, now they're scattered all over the area. Um, and, and they still came back to Jerusalem for festival time. So in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit first falls on the church, and the apostles come downstairs to the gathering crowds who heard the noise and were wondering what was going on, it says this. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, the provinces of Asia, Phygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the areas of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, and we all hear the people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed. What can this mean? They asked each other. Now, these people from all these places are all Jews. These are not like native people. These are all Jews. Um, most of them had lived in their other countries long enough that they spoke the language of that land. Most of them were probably born in that land. Their, their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents had scattered in the diaspora and so they're Jews living in other places, um, and yet they obeyed the ancient laws to come back to Jerusalem for festival. And so the Holy Spirit fell during the festival of Pentecost. That's a Jewish festival. They're all back in town for the Jewish festival of Pentecost, and, and now they're, they're here listening to the apostles. Um, so you see why this rule in Deuteronomy 14 was so useful. On top of the sheer distance that people had to travel just to come back to the place that God had chose for his name to be honored, in the first century, there was about 30,000 people living in Jerusalem, um, uh, according to the ancient censuses that they have found. And it's estimated that about 250,000, um, on average, would pour into the city for, for festival time uh, and the surrounding small towns and things. So just imagine the supply chain issues if eight times your population pours in for a week-long feast. I mean, obviously, it'd be very difficult to supply for all those people. Um, and all these people come in with bags full of money from their tithe from however many thousands of miles away. Um, hundreds of miles. I don't think that many live thousands and thousands of miles away. Um, and they all come in ready to buy feast supplies, party supplies. Um, because of this, honestly, and to try to limit gouging originally, um, and, and similar practices, the temple would source and sell festival provisions. They would actually go knowing the festival's coming. They would, they would buy up as much stuff as they could and have it there to make it convenient and to control pricing a little bit. Um, you, don't, you, don't have to, you didn't have to travel to Jerusalem from Rome or West Asia um, and then track down a vendor and figure out where you're going to buy stuff in competition with these other quarter of a million people. Um, you could just go straight to temple, purchase your tithe back right there in the temple courtyard. And even better, since the diaspora had scattered Jews in so many different lands, everybody came in with different money. Everybody came in with money from their places. And so there's, you've got skilled bankers right there who can, who can uh, convert money for you to the temple um, denarii. And, uh, and, and you could use that money to buy your tithe back and, and, and all the needed supplies. And this entire machine was created so people could uh, do what the Bible commanded them to do. To obey the scripture. To obey Deuteronomy 14. To bring your tithe. Feast in the place God chose for his name to be honored. And this is what makes Jesus' reaction to, to temple capitalism so terrifying. On paper, the temple leaders would have had a great argument for why they did everything they did. They could quote Deuteronomy 14 and easily justify every sale, every conversion, every dollar of profit. Yet when Jesus scanned the temple, he found that the temple leaders had a heart problem. If you remember, Jesus says where your treasure is, there your heart is. And, and you could look he looked at what was going on at all the treasure in the temple and he said there's too much treasure for hearts to be free. And here's why this scares me so badly. 
Right now, there's a thing that we tend to call church growth culture. I doubt this is news to any of us, but there, there's a movement toward the mega church. Within that style uh, of thinking, um, everything is measured by a head count. The only way to succeed is to grow in numbers. And, and this has spawned a bunch of programs copied from the business world to, to grow church attendance. And most of them work really well. And here's the hard part. Everybody loves growth. I'm excited every time a new family comes to our church. I study hard and I seek God's voice and I, I work hard to turn my studies into some kind of structure that I can preach on a Sunday morning. And of course I want as many people as possible to hear that. When we have a full house, there's an energy, more excitement. And no matter how you think or talk about it, growth is, is in, incredibly defendable. Easy to defend. More people worshiping Jesus is a good thing. More people connecting and serving is a good thing. More people escaping hell is a good thing. More people changing and growing is a really, really good thing. No one will ever walk into a church and actually discourage numeric growth. And yet, just as Jesus saw through all the excuses and defenses for buying and selling in the temple... I have a sneaking suspicion if he stepped into some of our most successful churches in America, he would flip some tables. And not because of anything they're really doing wrong, but because of a heart problem. Let's look at another example. In Deuteronomy 17, Moses tells the Israelites exactly what kind of king to look for when they decide they want a king. He says this, If this happens, be sure and select the king, uh, the man... Uh, Select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself. In that day, horses were only used in warfare. They were chariots. They, they rode donkeys. They used oxen to pull things. Horses were, were war animals. So he's basically saying this guy can't amass a big army. This is not a big military leader. Or send him to, to Egypt to buy horses. For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not have many wives for himself. Because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. When he sits on the throne as a king, he must copy for himself the book of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. So basically, what he's saying is, when you pick a king, not into army, not into money, not into women, and he's got to be a Bible guy. Sounds like somebody we know. <laughs> but first he says, be sure to select as king the Lord your God chooses. Let God pick. Which sounds an awful lot like Jesus. But the main point is that choosing a king was not a brand new idea when the nation finally decided they wanted a king. Moses had already made recommendations for that. He'd already laid that out. He already knew it was coming. But when the nation came to Samuel to ask for a king, they revealed an underlying heart issue. They said, finally, when the elders of Israel met at Ramah, they discussed the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are, not rejecti they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. We want to be like all the other nations. I don't think God had a problem with them having an earthly king. If they had asked for a king to help enforce Torah, if they had asked for a king to help the people stay focused on God, if they had asked for a king to help us worship God, better. I think God would have been all for it. But that's not what they said. They said, we want to be like everyone else. Except Israel was never supposed to be like everyone else. That was the point of Israel. They were supposed to be different from everyone else. To be a peculiar people, he said. To be different. But they wanted to fit in. Again, I, I, I think the church has bought into this problem. We do everything we can to look like, sound like, feel like the world, hoping to draw people into our churches. 
I can hear us cry out to Samuel, give us a light show like the other nations. Give us a coffee shop like the other nations around us. Give us a concert and a performance like the other nations. Give us a feel-good message like the nations around us. Give us full commercialism experiences like the other nations around us. And like with Israel's king, I I don't know that God has a problem with lights and coffee shops and entertaining worship and feel-good messages. It's the heart issue of wanting to be like the world so that we don't have to ask people to make a dividing choice. In this morning's message, Jesus isn't attacking their behavior. Their behavior is in line with Torah. He was attacking their hearts. They had taken an allowance given by Torah and used it to worship money. And the biggest mistake we could ever make when we read this morning's passage is the one that I think most of us make. The biggest mistake we can, we can make when we read this passage is for, is for you to stand on Jesus' side, for me to stand on Jesus' side. The disciples were shocked and confused. They, it even says that after he rose from the dead, they thought back and thought, oh, I, I don't think they really got it until later, personally. I think they stepped back and were like, I don't know what's happening right now. We are in the temple. What are you doing? And the only way they could make sense of it was to quote an obscure verse from a, from a psalm. But the disciples are confused and surprised. Obviously, everyone in the temple is offended. They're yelling at him, show us a sign if you're from God. In this story, Jesus is alone. It's just Jesus. No one stands in solidarity with Jesus as he defends God's home. So when we read it, we have to be really careful not to automatically stand on Jesus' side and shake our fingers. The only smart way to read this passage uh, is to assume that we'd be in the temple buying and selling and converting our money. So that when Jesus comes swinging his whip and flipping tables, we, we stop and allow ourselves to be scanned so we can hopefully catch any heart problems before they become chronic. We never stand on Jesus' side shaking our fingers. We go, okay, God, where am I buying into the wrong ideas? Where am I? What, what, what boundaries do I need to put up to protect myself from this obviously tempting situation where, where I take an allowance you've given me in Torah and I use it to, to, to do things I shouldn't? So here's what I suggest. First, we have to be open to the realization that we can do everything right and still be completely off. That can happen. If our heart isn't right, it doesn't matter if our behavior is right. This is the biggest problem with minimizing Christianity to a lifestyle. A list of do's and don'ts. You can do all the do's and don't all the don'ts and and still find yourself in the temple on the day Jesus breaks in. So we have to realize that righteousness is much deeper than behavior. In fact, this is what made David so different. In a land where obeying the rules was everything, comes this king who saw through that. And he prays this in Psalms 51. He says, you don't desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You don't want a burnt offering. And here's the crazy thing. God actually did want these sacrifices and offerings at least on paper. There are a couple books of Torah committed to explaining how much God wanted that sacrifice. But David somehow saw through that and realized that just obeying the rules was not what God desired. Which leads to my second recommendation. Ask for a new heart. God promised to give us a heart of flesh for the heart of stone that we have. We need that new heart. We simply cannot trust our own heart. Jeremiah said this, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? David, in the same psalm where he tells uh, that God isn't actually after our heartless obedience, he says this, he said, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. What God wants is your heart. So the way that David asked for a new heart, 
in that same psalm is he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Give me a, give me a clean heart. We need a new heart to replace our gross damaged heart. And finally, invite the Holy Spirit to walk with you and teach you and empower you and convict you. Heck, invite the Holy Spirit to come in and flip some tables. We simply cannot navigate a heart problem alone. We need a specialist. We need a heart surgeon, and there's none better than the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this on our own. That's why David prayed for a new heart. He didn't just make one. He didn't just muscle it up. Derek actually texted me this week. He was said in his prayer time, God was speaking to him that the problem with our generation is that they want to, this generation wants to fix everything. This is one of the most like compassionate and, and tender-hearted generations ever. Like they want to fix the world. They are they are warriors for 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 fixing things, but they want to do it in their own strength. That was the word Derek gave me. He said, but God tells me they're trying to do it in their own strength. And we're Americans. We're pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, people. And that is not how anything gets done. That is not how your heart gets fixed. We have to ask the Holy Spirit to come and empower us. We have to be humble enough to admit we cannot do this on our own. So how do we respond to this? My son, who has always had a, a sensitive conscience, we're going to pretend like I didn't tell you who he is. Um, years later, after hearing me teach on confession, um, on confessing to God in children's church, of all things, um, started this thing where... where Every few seconds, I would hear him whisper, sorry, God, the Father, sorry, Jesus, sorry, Holy Spirit. And then a few seconds later, sorry, God, the Father, sorry, Jesus, sorry, Holy Spirit. Um, which to me sounded like his sensitive conscience. If you know anything about Martin Luther, Martin Luther used to do this. Martin Luther used to um, spend hours and hours and hours in confession until finally his confessor kicked him out. It was like, do not come back until you actually sin. Because he would be like, he'd go, I had another bad thought just now. I need to confess that. Oh. There's another one. Like, like he would, and, uh, and this is before he obviously had his revelation of grace. But, but I would hear Elijah doing that, just whispering these apologies to God. So I thought it sounded like his sensitive conscience finally being steered toward the God who, who can actually cleanse and forgive him. And so I loved it. And then it turned out a few years later he was diagnosed with OCD. And uh, I found out that what I thought was a sensitive conscience was this obsessive thing that he kind of got stuck in. And he does have a very sensitive conscience. But, um, but a lot of times what we think is a good thing is not. And it's revealing that we've got a heart issue that we have to take to the Holy Spirit and ask for help. The human heart is hard to know even if you're the owner of that heart. So as we gather around the table this morning, ask the Holy Spirit. Beg the Holy Spirit to come and help you. This is not a job we can do alone. We need divine help, and the Holy Spirit was sent for that very purpose. So as we sing and gather around the table, ask the Holy Spirit to come and change your heart. Let's go to the table. Jesus took bread, lifting it up and giving thanks and praise. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. And now whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we declare the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, we gather around this table every week to remind ourselves that we're not here because we're good. We're not here because we're worthy. We're here because you sacrificed yourself for us. You gave yourself as an offering on our behalf. And that's the only reason we can stand here. It is so easy 
to slip into that self-reliance, to slip into that, I'm, I'm doing this on my own, to slip into that, I got this. Please help us remember, especially as we come to these elements that purchased our salvation, that we do not got this. We need to surrender to you, surrender to your power, surrender to the Holy Spirit. Help us do that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come? Doug, remember the body and blood of Christ. There's nothing I will remember.
out your hands and receive now this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you, Open Table Community Church. May he make his face to shine upon you and be good to you. May he lift up his counts upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. Dale, remember the body and blood of Christ. April. Remember the body and blood of Christ.